giving a few minutes for for people to join. A good morning, good afternoon, or a good evening, everyone, depending where you are. Welcome to today's webinars on small scale fisheries and blue justice, procedural and substantive rights of fisher fox, organized by the One Ocean Hub and the UN Nippon Fellows and Alumni. My name is Ana Suarez, and I work as a human rights specialist for the Fisheries Division of FAO, specifically on the implementation of the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication. Um, that would call for short the SSF guidelines. And I will be the facilitator of today's webinar. So before we start, we can go through some housekeeping rules. Um, this session will be recorded and will be available online afterwards. And as you can see, we have um, down the chat function and the more official Q&A function. So while people join, just please introduce yourselves to know who is here and uh, in the chat function. And if, if you have any comments um, while the presentation takes place, you can also make the comments in the chat function. But however, if your question is addressed specifically to one of the panelists or to the whole panel, just raise that question in the Q&A function, please, and specify who you, your question is addressed to. Um, the seminar today will explore the roles and practical relevance of international legal instruments for the recognition and full realization of the human rights of small scale fishers, such as the UN Declaration of the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas, and the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication. It will explain why these legal instruments came into being and discuss their respective contributions. We will then discuss how these instruments matter in the specific context of small scale fisheries in South Africa and Ghana. And our panelists will discuss what the, what the definition of small scale fisheries in these two countries entails at legal and practical levels, the problems that arise due to variability in the sector, and procedural and substantive rights in the context of small scale fisheries and the implications of COVID 19 to the protection of these rights. So our first panelists are um, Professor Elisa Morgera and PhD candidate Julia Nakamura. Elisa Morgera is a professor at global, of global environmental law and the director of the, Ocean, the One Ocean Hub and co-director of the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance. She specializes in international European and comparative environmental law with a particular focus on the interaction between biodiversity law and human rights particularly those of indigenous people and local communities. And Juliana Kamura is a PhD candidate at the University of Strathclyde. Her research investigates the contribution of international law to small scale fisheries through the lenses of an ecosystem approach and a, and a human rights approach to fisheries. In specific, it aims to promote the participation of small scale fishers in co-managing migratory aquatic species and Julia also works an, as a legal consultant for the FAO Development Law Service. And the presentation will be on the development and contribution of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas um, and the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication. So without further ado, Elisa and Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I will uh, deliver the presentation on behalf also of Julia based on a paper we have been working on together for a, for a little while now. And uh, Julia will be there to answer any questions um, on the parts of the presentation that she has worked the most. Uh, but just for, for expediency, making sure we respect time, uh, it'll be just myself delivering. Um, so the first presentation is really to look at what international law says around the human rights um, of individuals and communities in the small scale fisheries sector, uh, with a view to setting the scene um, to then uh, um, provide an, a basis for understanding practices on the ground. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really very excited that we have two other groups of researchers from across the One Ocean Hub, based in South Africa and in Ghana, 
they can then really um, uh, help us understand in what ways international law can support our understanding of the situation on the ground, our potential identification of solution, and also how we can build partnerships on the ground around implementing international law in ways that really respond to the needs um, and, and vision of um, specific communities. And, and, and just to give a very big, uh, very quick back background on the One Ocean Hub, this is a broad um, collaborative research uh, endeavor, which is funded by the UK Research and Innovation uh, Global Challenges Research Fund um, for, to really challenge researchers to work at the interface with uh, development practices and, and really thinking about research in ways that contribute concretely to the advancement of sustainable development in the terms and according to the needs of those the most um, contribute and benefit to sustainable development and particularly vulnerable communities, women and youth. Um, and it has been a great opportunity for me as mainly an international lawyer by training um, to learn and understand the issues from the colleagues on the call. Um, and I look even more forward to then having an exchange with the people on this call and the colleagues in the Nippon Fellow Group um, to really understand and get a sense of whether our research is indeed directed in a way that responds to concrete needs of right holders, of duty bearers, of researchers and other organizations that are supporting the work for the protection and full realization um, of human rights in the context of um, coastal and marine um, developments. And, and this is part, I think, one of the things that we're hoping to explore today is also looking at how we need to take our research across scales, looking at uh, cumulative pressures on the ocean and on those communities that are dependent on the ocean, how we need to think in terms of integrated governance across sectors, but also across scales, so that our responses can really mirror the connectivity of the ocean and our own connections to the oceans for our own well-being, culture and survival in some cases. Um, and so what we're trying to do with our presentations is exactly convey that sense of how far we have connected our areas of research, but also explore with you how much further we need to go in making sure that our understanding of laws at the international, regional, national and local level can really respond to the findings arising from other sciences and contribute with, with them to better frame the problems and support constructive dialogue across different sectors of society in different levels for uh, long lasting solutions that are based on, on fair and sustainable partnerships across all the actors that have a say, they have power, they are negatively affected um, by the challenges that affect the health of our ocean and our own well-being dependent on it. So for the purposes of this particular presentation, the work that Julie and I have done has really been looking in a comparative perspective to international guidance on the human rights um, of individuals and communities engaging in small scale fisheries. We have two international instruments that have been developed uh, by two different international organizations. On the one hand, the Food and Agriculture Organization Voluntary Guidelines, and we're very privileged to have um, uh, chairpersons with us today from FAO that can provide us their own direct insights, both into the development of the guidelines and all the work that has been already undertaken uh, to support their implementation. And on the other hand, looking at a slightly more recent instrument, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas, which also addresses um, the questions around small scale fisheries from slightly different perspectives. But what we want to explore with you today is in what ways those instruments are complementary to each other and help us understand all the facets um, and all the actors and the perspectives of all the actors involved in sustainable small scale fisheries uh, where we can see respect and protection and fulfillment of the human rights of um, uh, individuals and groups involved in small scale fisheries. So one thing to keep in mind as we compare the two instruments is that they were developed separately with slightly different processes and different, I think, um, uh, approaches. Uh, and that's where their um, value added comes as well. So the FAO guidelines were, were actually mandated by the UN General Assembly to FAO, which led a um, multi-stakeholder process over quite a few years. And eventually they were adopted um, uh, by the Committee on Fisheries, a specialized committee under the FAO governance structure 
by consensus, um, over 110 states that were present at the time. And consensus is a really strong uh, and important signal that states are really behind and ready to uh, start action to implement a certain instrument, even if the instrument is voluntary guidelines. Uh, and the, the, the purpose was that of looking at an instrument that can explain how international fisheries law and international environmental law can be read together in the context of small scale fisheries, bringing also um, a human rights based approach. So the idea is that the, the guidelines really explain how different areas of international law that are relevant to the context of small scale fisheries need to be read together in an operative way and in a, a supportive way. Um, and of course, because of FAO being the, the knowledge holder within the UN system of, of fisheries, a lot of technical understanding of how fisheries are governed uh, at the regional and national level has, of course, um, enriched the guidelines and provide a lot of fine, important detail to understand where and how uh, decisions and management approaches and um, allocation of resources are needed to support um, the human rights of small scale fishing communities and individuals. Um, but in a, one of the findings in our paper uh, is that the guidelines are particularly helpful for those who find themselves at the duty bearing side. So the, the state organs and institutions who have to promote and ensure the respect and fulfillment of human rights um, of small scale fisher, fisher folk. So there's very much an institutional perspective um, and, um, and the guidelines are framed as recommendations, which may have explained why states were um, ready to adopt them by consensus um, and has a plethora of follow-up processes the FAO has been um, carrying out to really support and provide a set of um, um, areas of assistance to governments and others uh, in implementing the guidelines including through legislative guidance. So looking at where national laws are already supporting small scale fisheries and when, where maybe they need to be reinforced or adapted. So very important work to really link what we discuss internationally to then uh, the reality on the ground via national legislation. On the other hand, the Declaration on Peasants' Rights really started as a long standing effort by social movements, the international agrarian movement uh, to have recognition for their role and contributions um, and also respect for their rights um, due to um, a variety of shared sources of discriminations that have been experienced um, across rural areas in the world. And eventually leading to the Human Rights Council, um, a subsidiary body of the General Assembly where um, the declaration was then negotiated uh, by governments with still inputs from uh, agrarian movements as well as um, specialized organizations and academics and other. Um, and eventually the final text was adopted both by the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly by majority. And that's quite indicative because if we compare that to consensus support for the guidelines, we can see that certain countries, particularly um, highly um, developed ones, had expressed concerns or even opposition to the declaration. Now, why is that the case? If the declaration also meant uh, in a similar way to the FAO guidelines to understand how international law and particularly international human rights law applies to small scale fisheries among other rural um, sectors. Um, and what we understand also from other scholars that have worked on the topic and particularly our good colleague Lorenzo Cotula is that in a way the declaration has been able to capture more of the vision of the right holders, really the perspectives and the needs of um, small scale fishers as well as other peasants um, and their own vision maybe of a, of a broader change in current structures of food systems and production that really uh, in terms of globalization preclude if not um, make um, their own view, um, worldviews uh, difficult to be realized um, in many different ways and, and contribute to explain all those embedded mechanisms of discrimination that they uh, face. So there is in a way the UN declaration provides a different um, perspective on the same very same issues that we will find in the guidelines, the perspective of right holders and provides maybe um, captures in a way more the voices of right holders uh, than we may find in other instruments. And that may be um, something that governments may find themselves um, in more, facing more challenges in responding to. 
So nevertheless, I think once we look at the rules into the two instruments, we see that there is a lot of commonality. Um, and we find that again, the different perspectives that we find in the two instruments are really helpful to understand all the sides to the debate. Um, the guidelines, the FAO guidelines speak about sources of vulnerability and marginalization. Um, the declaration speaks specific about systemic sources and ingrained uh, discriminatory views, but if you com confer, com compare the two lists, we find very similar issues related to access to land and resources or, or expropriation or eviction from those resources, um, the need for social protection and um, um, the potential competition between small scale fisheries and other sectors, um, other economic sectors. The FL guidelines take an approach that um, identifies good practices, so really looking at the governance of fisheries, the inner workings of it, and where there are entry points for the protection of the environment and protection of human rights. Um, maybe it doesn't call into question fundamental uh, reforms, but it does look at very specific and pragmatic ways to advance significantly the protection of the rights of small scale fishing individuals and communities. And I think what, what we have come to understand is that th this is a really important translation and a very accessible translation of several complex areas of international law that seems to be um, quite um, operational on, on the face of it for those specialized managers and decision makers who are in practice those who implement the human rights obligations for the state in this particular context. Um, the declaration instead, as we said, is more reflective of the voices and the needs of um, small scale fisheries, uh, fishing communities and individuals, as well as other peasants. And really makes more explicit links by, by looking at um, uh, all these issues in terms of the rights of those groups um, and looking at how their lived experience and practical needs are very much part and parcel of how uh, states have to provide for the right to adequate standard of living. So there's a very clear link between what are the concrete dimensions and real life factors of um, for, um, for the realization of the vision of, of peasants and how that uh, is protected in terms of, of human rights. Uh, and as I said, th these two pictures are, are very much compatible. They just focus on different aspects. Um, one of the things that is uh, common to both instruments is that um, there is no one definition uh, of small scale fisheries. This is a common approach that we find also, for instance, in relation to international law and indigenous peoples. Um, and it's very much based on the understanding that this is such a diverse, um, th this can be such diverse individuals and groups that a universal and rigid definition would be impractical and potentially ineffective to capture these dynamic um, societal forms. Even if, on the other hand, both globally and nationally and locally, we do need uh, disaggregated data to really understand how this sector uh, fares compared to others. Uh, but the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants provides interesting pointers for governments to reflect upon who are the right holders um, under their jurisdiction. Um, it looks at um, both people and communities uh, that engage in artisanal and small scale fishing and related occupation in rural areas for subsistence or for the market. Um, and this really shows a, a, a broad understanding of the sector, also including um, cultural practices on land, such as making nets or, or maintain, maintaining boats. Um, but it very much emphasizing the, the family labor dimension or other forms of organizing labor that are non monetized and the dependency and attachment to land, which can be understood as also attachment to, to fishing grounds and the need to control in those grounds as part of how the, human, the fundamental human rights are, are realized in terms of standard of living. Uh, and the declaration is also very clear that um, the um, peasants engaging in small scale fisheries includes hired workers, including migrant and seasonal workers. And so also individuals who may not only work in, as small scale fishers, but may do that as um, together with other occupations. Um, this is again quite compatible with what we find in the FAO guidelines, where we have attention to fishers as well as fish works, uh, workers and their communities and organizations. 
Uh, and what we find in the guidelines is maybe more clarity around the fact that small scale fisheries can apply in all contexts in marine, inland waters. We're also potentially looking at aquaculture um, and really in different, uh, there may be different forms, commercial, artisanal, semi-industrial subsistence and, and potentially also recreational activities. So a sense maybe more of, of how this, um, uh, what are the, the more technical characteristics of the sector, as well as those intrinsic um, elements that basically um, capture under the declaration, the, the idea of place of work as a source of social identity, once again, citing our colleague Lorenzo Cotula. But one thing we will discuss go, going into the case studies is how, for how much it's good to have this criterion sense of flexibility so that at the national and local level, we have more targeted approaches to reality. There is a risk that um, inappropriate definitions and interpretations may be taken at the national level and um, right holders may be left out of protection. And this is really an important point that hopefully we can discuss today. Um, the other key uh, aspect that we will discuss in the presentation is how both instruments very much uh, focus on the importance of tenure and ownership of land and fishing grounds. In a way, they both um, capture an understanding it's now very clearly embedded in international human rights law around the importance of recognizing and protecting legitimate tenure rights to land and important natural resources. Um, and this may be customary rights, which may not be necessarily formally recognized. Uh, they may be non-conventional, um, but need to be respected nonetheless. And we have a, um, um, a long-standing um, work in international human rights law around this issue, uh, which remains a very uh, tricky one to implement in practice in many countries. Um, and that also includes obligations to restore uh, relevant people's access to their lands um, in cases also of natural disasters or armed conflict and facilitating um, equitable access, including through redistributive reform, if that may be the case. Now, once we look at the, at the details of the two instruments, um, the UN Declaration on Peasants' Rights, again, provides a slightly different perspective, distinctive perspective. Um, first of all, underline an obligation to give priority to small scale fishers, among other peasants, in the allocation of public lands and fisheries. Um, and this is really part of the understanding of how territories and, um, and different areas may be necessary for uh, the livelihoods of small scale fishers. And so there are broad references to having access to land and water, fisheries, pastures and forests, so that there is um, the human connection among habitats that reflects different patterns of livelihoods, including alternative livelihoods is taken into account. It, it's challenging governments not to look at small scale fisheries simply in terms of access to fishing grounds, even if that may be one of the central elements of livelihoods for small scale fishing groups and individuals. On the FAO guidelines side, we have instead an approach which brings uh, more emphasis on the ecosystem approach to fisheries. Uh, we speak of uh, granting preferential access to small scale fishers to land and fisheries resources. Um, and here what we have is more at calling attention to the interconnections among different forms and, um, uh, and parts of, um, of water bodies that are part of an ecosystem approach to fisheries. So looking at the socio-ecological interconnections and maybe um, the, the ecological interdependencies in that context. Um, in both instruments, we have again, a similar uh, crystal um, reflection of where of what has been now clearly understood in international human rights law in terms of the necessary safeguards um, for um, indigenous groups and other um, um, natural resource dependent groups to their lands and natural resources, uh, how we can respect and protect all their rights that are dependent on natural resources by employing the use of prior impact assessments and engaging in consultation and seeking consent and providing for fair and equitable benefit sharing. And these are three standards that have, for the most part, clarified in, uh, in international human rights law with regard to indigenous peoples, but they also matter, for instance, in the, con in the context of discrimination against women and in the context of having access to traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and, and, and other groups. Um, so we have the similar approach in both instruments, but again, with different emphasis 
the UN declaration really looks at the need to engage those um, safeguards before any kind of exploitation that may affect the natural resources that peasants hold or use um, and rely upon traditionally. Um, they also look at the need for consultations before the preparation of any food safety, labor and environmental standards, so important pieces of legislation that clearly affect um, the work and lives of small scale uh, fishing communities and individuals. Um, and they look at benefit sharing in terms of um, modalities that need to be agreed upon in taking any measures in, in regarding the exploitation of natural resources. Um, now, the FAO guidelines may be um, emphasize more the risks of large, large scale projects um, over small scale uh, fishing activities. Um, in terms of impact assessment, but then in terms of consultation, they look at a variety also of policies um, and management measures that may have to do both directly with fisheries, but also with other sectors that very much have an impact on fisheries ranging from trade, uh, climate change and disaster risk prevention, um, broader marine spatial planning, and including the, the setting of research priorities. And what we have, I think, is a bit of a, a more expanded understanding of how benefit sharing works and in what ways it is meaningful to small scale um, fisher folk. So first of all, there, there's, a I think, a clearer relation between benefit sharing and uh, the ecosystem approach, seeing the distribution of benefits as a reward and recognition of the contribution that small scale fishing communities make to responsible fisheries management more generally, their role as ecosystem stewards. There's an understanding that the sharing of benefits is also part of non-discriminatory approaches, uh, be that related to gender or culture, and the, the need to understand benefits across scales, not looking necessarily only at the local level, but really thinking around how small scale fishing communities can benefit from wider economic developments, uh, such as tourism, but also international trade. So th these processes and the safeguards have been used uh, widely also in other sectors, and there are concerns that they may be used in ways that are quite conservative or may actually in practice not necessarily be um, fully uh, transformative in terms of the, the real genuine protection and full realization of the rights of um, uh, indigenous peoples and other um, small scale fishing communities. And I think the research that we, I have done also previously has really showed that from a legal perspective, it is possible to, to identify where how these safeguards can be used for transformative potential. And that really has to do with using these safeguards, not as a tick box exercise, but as a collaborative identification of opportunities for positive impacts, not just as a way to um, prevent negative impacts from happening. And that really hinges on communities agency, their ability to articulate and be listened and understood in their different worldviews um, so that the process is meant to um, support communities choice and capabilities. And, and the argument we develop in the paper is that both the UN declaration and the FAO guidelines can really help thinking through this process, how those safeguards can be used to, um, for that supporting the community agency. And as we were saying, the, the declaration really provides um, a clearer sense of what are the demands and the needs from small scale fishing communities, their values, and that can really inform then how case by case assessments are carried out. So a better understanding on the side, supporting a better understanding on the side of decision makers and others about the daily realities of marginalization, as we were saying, the concrete real life needs um, for um, carrying forward a certain um, vision of life. And understanding that some sources of discrimination are systemic, uh, and so looking further afield than maybe a necessarily a specific development, and understanding multiple dimensions of poverty, which has to do with voice as well as control of resources, and that very much speak to it to an interface between procedural rights, access to information, uh, participation in decision making, and access to justice, as well as the substantive rights. And for its part, the FAO guidelines really provide an, a mapping of where uh, in current fisheries management systems and fisheries governance systems, we find opportunities to put in practice that understanding of the needs and values and priorities of small scale fishing communities. 
Um, also, they emphasize the need for um, support that needs to be provided to communities um, and really clarifying, really thinking about, well, what is it that then decision makers need to do and making that quite clear, which I think is essential um, for, for all, I think, involved in this to, to be clear about their role, responsibilities and the opportunities that they may open up. So I'll, I'll, I'll close here with a question that I'm sure will come up from the other presentations and the discussion. And it's really to say that some of the concerns um, um, addressed in the FAO guidelines and the declaration are captured in some of the sustainable development goals. We have reference to small scale fishers and their need to access resources and markets. But I think it's hard by looking at the SDG to see how those targets can be implemented in coherence with all the other sustainable development goals. And I think that reading together of the UN declaration and the FAO guidelines provides a very clear map of how we can ensure um, diminishing hunger, we can ensure poverty reduction, we can ensure gender, uh, prevent gender discrimination and all other goals by following those steps that the two instruments have uh, distilled for us based on um, different areas of international law. So I'll leave it at that for now. And um, yeah, I look forward to questions and, and discussion. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, just to remind uh, all of you that you can make specific questions to the panelists in the Q&A function. And um, I would like now to, this, to, to give the panel to our next, next, um, the, our next panelist. Um, that they will discuss, um, okay, sorry, no, I just had something in my screen, a change. Um, they, they will discuss how they, this, these instruments that Elisa just uh, gave us this explanation matter in the specific context of small scale fisheries in, in South Africa. So I introduce uh, Dr. Bernadette Snow, the director of the Institute for Coastal and Marine Research and a lecturer at Nelson Mandela University. She has extensive experience in marine social ecological system research and focuses on environmental and social just development that is sustainable. And she's, the cur she's currently the in-country director for the o One Ocean Hub in South Africa. And I will also like to introduce Mrs. Tarin Pereira. She's a researcher at the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University. And Tarin, together with other colleagues, uh, lead the Lalela Uluande. I, I'm probably not pronouncing this right. This means listen to the sea. And it's a theater production, research and engagement project implemented along the KwaZulu Natal coastline in South Africa. And Lalela Uluande forms also part of the One Ocean Hub. So uh, Bernadette and Tarin, the floor is yours. Bernadette, if you can unmute yourself. Apologies, I will go back. <clears throat> Rookie mistake, <laughs> and then we have to make it first time. All right, again, sorry for that. Thank you so much, Anna, for the introduction and Elisa for the um, providing the foundation. Taryn and I will be sharing this presentation. Um, I will provide a little bit of context. Taryn will give some examples and then we will um, wrap up with a few reflections as we go forward. So just to give a little bit of background, Elisa provided it from a global perspective. And um, I went and reflected a little bit on how are these um, contained within the South African policy and legal context and frameworks. And looking at the small scale fishers policy in particular within South Africa, there are clear three definitions for the fisher, for the sector and for the community within this um, policy. Um, and if you look at that, you can see similar words and wording and definitions and descriptions as contained in both the UN DROP as well as the FAO guidelines, voluntary guidelines. 
So if we look at it, you can see that they are looking at those who are harvesting, processing, marketing, then using low technology, passive gear, and also look at close to the shore and single day fishing trips. And looking a little bit more at sail or barter, and it may involve commercial activity if we look at the fisher itself. When we look at the sector, it particularly looks at um, own net making, boat building, um, additional fishery related employment and income opportunities, and also looking at um, the seasonal basis. So those that are looking um, and fishing for seasonal um, on a seasonal basis in commercial activities. They also then add in a community um, with the understanding that many of these fisher folk are within a community. And so this is a particularly social cultural group or persons together that historically have been fishermen and fisherwomen. Um, they also include workers and other families that um, group together that um, are um, historically have been involved with rights to harvesting, catching, um, customary land tenure and so forth. And they are usually operating near or in the seashore or coastal waters that have been enjoyed access to marine living resources. Just to give further context, the Marine Living Resources Act is the legal instrument and it was promulgated in 1988. Originally, the, the act itself did not recognize subsistence or small scale fishers um, per se. However, later amendments that were brought in recognized subsistence and fishers, and this then was later changed to exclude the word subsistence fishers and only provide the definitions for small scale fishers. Due to all some rights claims, the, the policy was then developed in support of the Marine Living Resources Act uh, to assist with the uh, small scale fishery implementation within the country. Just to, to add on to the def definition as uh, provided by um, Mill Soman, who is also a member of the One Ocean Hub, um, looks at the term recognizes that the small scale fisher as a term includes subsistence fishers, small scale fishers and artisanal fishers, fishers with general characteristics, simple technology, labor intensive methods, relatively low capital inputs and also a wide range of organizational levels. Um, in her paper, and was also highlighted by Lisa, there is not a one size fits all, and that context does matter. We cannot apply these as a broad scale definitions um, across all fishing, fishing communities. So within South Africa, to just give a little context, we are broken up into um, different provinces, but the provinces I will focus on are those that are along the coast. The yellow for the Northern Cape, the red for the Western Cape, blue is Eastern Cape, and our green is the KwaZulu-Natal area. If we look at context just within the province, there are differences between the small-scale fishery, fisheries within each of these different provinces. The Northern Cape and the Western Cape, the yellow and the red, are more involved in um, low commercial species are well organized, um, also are those that um, fit the definition quite clearly as the small scale fisheries, fisheries policy, um, have their own equipment, are, are involved in fixing, net making, maintaining, selling, and in um, the value chain. If we look at the Eastern Cape and um, KwaZulu Natal, the blue and the green, in Eastern Cape in particular, it's diverse from rural subsistence fishers to those that live in urban areas that are considered seasonal and migrant workers on commercial um, vessels, and also who have a long history or tradition of fishing at sea or working and catching these um, particular high commercial, uh, high value commercial species, for example, the squid industry. Along the KwaZulu-Natal coast, you're also looking at subsistence and small-scale fishers, communities and groups um, who do not necessarily identify um, under the definition of the small-scale fisher as according to what's in the policy. So let's add in a shock like COVID that has happened. And what we have seen is that there has been increased marginalization of the small scale fisher communities, whether they are within a rural context or with, whether they are within an urban context. 
there have been increased vulnerabilities within the small scale fisheries community in South Africa. And if we can apply similar shocks like global market crashes, um, further pandemics, um, or any of those other sort of um, climate change related um, issues, we can see that if we do not um, look at mechanisms to address the social injustices, to address accessibility, these increased vulnerabilities will occur. And then what we are going to focus on a little bit more is how during COVID, um, even taking the current laws and, um, and definitions into account, procedural rights have been impacted. And here I will hand over to Taryn. Thanks so much, Bernie. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just share sort of three uh, examples from just the last few months of um, procedural injustices that small scale fishers and subsistence fishers in South Africa have experienced. Um, and yeah, just to sort of emphasize or say again what, what Bernie has been speaking to is the fact that the, the rights on their own, the, the hard won small scale fisher policy and the rights that fishers have under that, um, under the MLRA in South Africa are not on their own responsive to the context of inequalities in the market, of unequal access to resources and information, and all of the um, power imbalances that exist in our society along lines of race, class, and gender. And without the, the, the right and the implementation of the right being more responsive to those um, realities and contexts, um, there are unintended uh, consequences and unintended sort of perpetuation of inequalities. Um, and, and one of the main sort of ways in which this uh, plays out is that the lives and the rights of fishers are not um, always well understood by officials on the ground. And by that, I mean law enforcement officials or conservation officials, um, those who are coming into direct contact with fishers who, um, in their day-to-day -day lives and in pursuit of their livelihoods. Um, and nor are they very well understood by many who actually influence decision-making, um, such as um, scientists or environmental consultants who play an active role in um, the kind of procedural aspects of policy making. Next slide, Bernie. Thank you. Um, so just a, an example of um, the consultation processes that have continued under COVID-19 lockdown in South Africa. Um, one of these has been the environmental and social impact assessment scoping report for an application being made by Total um, to do exploratory drilling um, in quite a large block off the southeastern coast of South Africa. Um, and the, the block that will um, be sort of the focus for these explorations um, covers an, an area of the coastline um, where there are at least 30, there are 30 registered small scale fishing cooperatives and other small scale fishing communities who may not yet um, have officially formed co-ops in the impacted area. And none of these were informed of the process or specially invited to the consultations. Some were able to participate um, in a kind of compromised way. They found out through civil society partners or research partners. Um, um, we, as a research group, identified the fact that there were no translations into Isikosa or into Afrikaans, which um, are the languages spoken by fishers in this part of the country. Um, when we asked for translations, these were posted online, um, but still therefore not very accessible. Um, so that, yeah, the consultations taking place during this time um, in South Africa, we had different levels of lockdown with um, lessening degree of restriction, but the consultation for this process took place during levels four and three, meaning there were no in-person meetings. Um, and so, of course, the barriers to participation were very high. Um, if fishers did not have 
data or Wi-Fi or the right kind of devices, they couldn't join. And even if they could join, the, the nature of the online webinar, which is, it's very, very difficult to engage. It's difficult to do adequate translation into other language. It's quite um, technical and therefore not very conducive to dialogue and participation. Um, and just the last point on this is that um, the commercial fisheries who are organized into various associations and so on are far more enabled to participate and are viewed by the environmental consultants as stakeholders and therefore are invited and included and have their concerns um, really heard. And this creates a further wedge of inequality between the commercial sector and the, and the small scale fishers. Um, and then another example of a, of a consultation process that's been happening very recently um, is for the new integrated management plan for the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Isimangaliso Wetland Park, which is in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Um, this is a large, um, a large conservation area. Um, with many um, small scale fisher communities and some cooperatives that have now formed. Um, and the integrated management plan has real implications for the customary rights holders, there are land claimants in the area um, and the small scale fishers. Um, but these groups have not been adequately consulted and their local knowledge hasn't been included in this integrated management plan. Um, to repeat some of the issues that uh, I spoke to on the previous example, you know, the consultations are mostly online. Um, this has happened in a time where there was able to be a small number of in-person meetings, but these have been, you know, they just are announced the day before they happen. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a, a big problem that we've picked up is that the environmental consultants don't often have a very good understand, understanding um, of local political dynamics. So they might invite um, the chief, the traditional leadership, but don't recognize or include other community structures, which really um, yeah, does not do justice to proper participation and often actually um, exacerbates tensions at a, at a local scale where traditional leadership um, may not be representing the, the community very widely and may not be representing the best interests of the majority. Um, there are a lot of maps in this integrated management plan which are only available online and there's been no translation into Zulu or Istonga. Um, when we do see translations, there are maybe an executive summary. And in something like this, which is all about zonation and changes to specific regulations, an executive summary that speaks about the overarching vision for an integrated management plan, when that's translated into the local language, it really is quite meaningless. People need to know about the detail and how it will affect them where they live. Um, and the, you know, the small scale fisheries regulations for South Africa require, speak about um, small scale fishers being included in decisions relating to demarcation of areas for fishing. Um, and this IMP doesn't say anything about uh, the new zonation. There's a new marine protected area and there's nothing about how the, the, the different uh, sort of overlapping policies will be integrated with one another. So how will the new MPA um, meet the rights of the fishers um, in this particular space? Thanks, Bernie. Next slide. Um, my third example um, is uh, the, the case of Durban's subsistence fishes. Um, so our One Ocean Hub colleagues, Jackie Sunday and Kira Irwin have just completed this really fantastic report um, that has been commissioned by the South Durban Community Environment Alliance. Um, it's called Cast Out and it's about the systematic exclusion of the KwaZulu Natal subsistence fishers from the rights regime in South Africa, fishing rights regime. Um, and what we've seen, there, there's a long and fascinating history of exclusion that this particular group of fisher folk have, 
faced. Um, what we see um, currently is that um, they are they self-identify as subsistence fishers and they've not been included in the small-scale fisher policy process. And it means that they fall through the gap and um, they fish using recreational licenses, but they are very much fishing to feed their families. They are fishing in accordance with intergenerational cultural practices. Um, it is a part of identity and it's, a, it's, it's very much fishing for, for food and a, a small amount of, uh, um, you know, bartering or, or for sale. Um, but they have been told by, um, they've been told by officials that subsistence fisheries no longer exist. And under lockdown, what this meant was that when there was an exemption for small scale fishers to fish, these subsistence fishers, because they do not, um, they kind of fall between the gap because of the overly rigid um, policy definition. Um, and they were then harassed, arrested, and not allowed to fish at a time when families were most desperate. So this just shows the kind of perverse effects of a policy that isn't sensitive enough to context and that's overly rigid and reliant on quite broad categories. Um, Thanks, Bernie. Thank you, Taryn. Um, also, some of the other policies um, global um, reflections um, need to be taken into account, and there's many pluralities in this. So, for example, when talking about the integrated management plan, is also looking at conventions on biodiversity um, that actually state that small scale fishers or local and indigenous um, knowledge holders have a right to information and participation, which was also excluded and not considered in that particular case. So if we look at it um, and we reflect upon both the global as well as the local definitions and legal frameworks, we notice there's plurality and disconnect between the different um, instruments. We also understand that the contextual realities add a deep complexity that is very difficult to manage. So it's, it's easier for a lot of officials or for implementation to adhere to rigid and immovable um, legislations and definitions uh, because it's easier to manage. However, this does mean that there are many communities that are seen as not being um, um, considered, like the case for the KwaZulu-Natal fishers in terms of the subsistence by encapsulating them under small-scale fishers, but they are not then forming these cooperatives, that that reality has, um, has then not been met um, in terms of what was the actual case or the reason for the small-scale fisheries policy. We also noted and reflected that there is a need to build in redundancy and flexibility as well as a mechanisms for adaptability um, in policy instruments and how these can change and feed into then the legal um, acts and laws um, that will govern the small scale fisheries. And we then go from the question um, that links uh, to what Elisa and um, Julia have said is how can these particular global frameworks and these um, different guidelines support local efforts to protect these particular procedural rights that we have seen through these different cases under extreme conditions for the small scale fishes communities um, be supported. Thank you very much for your attention and time, and we look forward to questions at the end. Thank you, thank you very much, Bernadette and Tarin, for this very, very interesting presentation. Um, now, um, we should continue with, the, with our next presentation for the final presentation of today. Uh, our next panelist will make uh, their presentation focusing on, on substantive rights of small scale fisheries in Ghana. So I'd like to present Dr. Bolanle Erinosho and Dr. Harrison Kwame Golo. Dr. Bolanle Erinosho is affiliated with the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Her research focuses on international environmental law, ocean law and governance and African Union law. 
As part of the One Ocean Hub, she carries out work on legal pluralism and customary law of ocean fishes community in Ghana. Also on human rights approaches to fisheries and implementation and compliance with ocean laws and marine special planning. And Dr. Harrison Kwame Golo is a senior lecturer at the International Human Rights in the International Human Rights at the Center for Conflict Human Rights Studies, the University of, Edu of Education, Winneba, Ghana. His study focuses on poverty and vulnerability and their impact on children's rights and fishing communities in Ghana. He has investigated the interactive conditions under which poverty, vulnerability, livelihoods, and coping strategies result in child labor and child trafficking in fishing communities. So, um, Dr. Bonale and Harrison, you have the, the floor. Thank you, um, Anna. Um, I will just start my slides and then we can have a quick run through. So I will do most of our presentation and then Harrison will come in at the end to um, answer a few questions and also to reiterate the discussion around um, child labor and child trafficking if we have enough time towards the end because uh, that's his specialization. Uh, so today, uh, what we would like to do is to provide some local context to the discussions uh, which Elisa and Julia have kindly framed in their paper around small scale fisheries. And so we will be highlighting um, how small scale fisheries are conceived in Ghana and what are the particular challenges around small scale fisheries. Particularly in our case, we will focus on women and children and how those challenges have um, a more focused impact on them. And so we sort of start off with a um, picture of the Ghanaian coast, uh, which is quite a, uh, actually a very long coast, almost 550 kilometers um, and approximately about 24,300 square kilometers of um, um, shelf area. And in Ghana, almost a quarter of the population live along the coast. So it is a, a very significant um, area of land for many in Ghana. And it's in fact, um, contributes much of our annual protein intake and provides um, direct jobs of almost 200,000 and indirect jobs of almost 2 million. So the fisheries industry is perhaps one of the most significant um, industries in Ghana. And it, it is in that sense steeped in not just, um, um, it's steeped in both politics and a lot of contestations, which would often flow through in any dealings that you have with the oceans, as well as with the rights of fisheries communities. So there is, um, there is a lot of politics and a lot of socioeconomic considerations, which would often go into any discussions of small scale fishing in Ghana. Um, so to start off with, we would like to highlight how small scale fisheries are defined in Ghana. And now to do that, we would go to the Fisheries Act, which is, uh, which was adopted in 2002, a few amendments here and there, but the core of the act, essentially in our context, which is a bit different from the South African context, we define fisheries according to the method of fishing. So how what kind of method do you use? And that determines what category you fall into in terms of the fishing industry. So in our case, the act talks about artisanal fishing, which is usually fishing using dugout canals. And I have a picture on the next slide, um, usually made locally by traditional boat makers. And it would also of course include the, those who use hooks for fishing and those who use nets from the beach. And then we have got what is classed as the inshore semi-industrial fishing, which is fishing with um, the motorboard. So usually slightly bigger boats, which have got um, the um, board so they can go a bit further out. And then of course, we've got the industrial fishing, which is with trawlers and 
in our case, majority of them are tuna vessels and they're for exports. So much of the tuna that is caught in Ghana is not actually for the local market, but for exports abroad, uh, mainly to the European Union. Now, the Act, of course, says that um, both artisanal and inshore fisheries should be reserved for Ghanaian citizens or Ghanaian-owned companies. Now, the challenge with that, however, is the Act is silent or ignores the fact that there are significant population of migrant fishers from other West African countries, and those actually have uh, connections to uh, sometimes Ghanaian citizens, because often Ghanaian fishers would also, uh, at different times of the year, migrate to other West African countries to also fish, and they come over. But the act is at the moment silent on those kinds of fishers. Now, of course, the act also, by saying that the companies should be owned by Ghanaians, really leaves a loophole for um, what we call shell companies. So yes, on paper, the company is owned by Ghanaians, but in actual fact, all of the day-to-day -day operations are by um, foreign um, partners. And so the Ghanaian essentially provides the license and the foreign partner um, does all of the fishing. And that's one of the gaps in the current framework as we have it. Um, of course, with industrial fishing, like I mentioned, that can be reserved for foreign partners, but there are huge conflicts around um, access rights. So whilst there is an insure zone, which is dedicated to the smaller scale fishing folks, um, in practice, what we have found when speaking to fishing communities is they've often felt that the trawlers actually um, incur into their zone and deprive them of fishing stock. And so one of the main things is that um, complaint about them being pushed out of their zone. And of course, vice versa, they would often sometimes wander out into, uh, out of their zone and their nets can get entangled as well. And um, it's important to note at this point that whilst in Ghana, our fisheries are actually open access. All of this is of course subject to licensing, which I have sort of alluded to in the Fisheries Act. Now, focusing now on small scale fisheries, which I will do going forward. Um, small scale fisheries in our case, that is artisanal fishermen, as I said, we call them. Uh, actually the largest section of our fishing industry. And so we have over 13,000 registered canoes and they are in as many as 315 landing sites and almost 80% of all the fish that is actually caught is caught by small scale fishers. So they're actually um, in, in practical terms, the most important segment of our fishing industry. Now, I would quickly, as fast as possible, and I apologize for rushing through this, but I do not want to take up too much time so we can have enough time for questions and answers. So I will quickly rush through some of the challenges which face them and how that actually particularly impacts on women. Now, the key thing that we have going at the moment is declining fish catches. In our context, um, we have witnessed significant decline in our catches over the last five or so years. Um, in fact, there are predictions that our industry might collapse in the next five years if not much work is done about this. So declining fish catches are a big problem for us and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the multitude of reasons and some of them we would allude to here and others we wouldn't go into too much detail about but it's suffice to say that it's important to note that because women in Ghana and in coastal communities in particular um, are often responsible for family sustenance for nutrition for food security they are more particularly impacted by the declining fish catches than perhaps the men. And I say that because culturally the structure of the family system for many coastal communities is there are often men who are polygamous. And what that means is women will be responsible for themselves on their children. And so when we have declining fish catches, the poverty 
uh, which you know is attendant on that is actually uh, more impacted on the women. Now, of course, fishing is also very highly gendered in our context. And so whilst we say fisher folk, because we're talking about the whole community around fishing, but the actual act itself is only done by men. And so women can only be in other parts of a processing network and not the actual fishing itself. Now, what that means is that when it comes to decision making around fisheries, they are often excluded uh, from the highest levels of decision making. Because of course, if you're not going onto the sea, then you have limited um, avenue to make your complaints known. Um, there are of course other challenges around unsustainable fishing methods, which will lead to declining. Um, light fishing is a problem in our context, um, using insecticides and noxious substances. Those are certain challenges which we face. But back to the point about exclusion from decision-making, um, it's important to note that because of the way our fish uh, our fishing communities are set up. Uh, the traditional governance system, of course, is led by a chief and um, uh, fisheries leaders uh, um, who will be in charge of decision making around fishing. Now, whilst there are actually women leaders, particularly for the marketing of the fish, the majority is often still. Uh, centered around the male. So there is still quite a lot of exclusion of women from the key religious and political roles around in fishing communities. Now, it's also important to note that there are decision making even around fishing. Um, the G Ghana's fisheries management plan, the one we had which ended last year 2019 often talks about participation in decision making and inclusion in decision making but in actual fact what we have found out is that participation is very narrowly construed and in practical terms there are significant portions of the population who are excluded and so an example will be recently this year earlier before just at the start of the lockdown, there was controversy because um, it was felt that the government allocated new licenses for foreign trawlers, uh, which was contrary to a moratorium which they had initially agreed to. And that decision, um, many of the constituents felt they didn't understand how that decision was arrived at because much of, many of them were not actually consulted. Um, I'd also like to highlight at this point the problem of child labor and child trafficking, which is a significant problem in coastal communities. Uh, many kids are often trafficked from um, the hinterland, the Volta Lake area, and from neighboring countries to come and work in coastal fishing communities. And Harry, if we have the time, can talk a bit more about that. Now, what, what are the key things we would like to highlight here. So in our context, of course, um, we have been looking at how a human rights framework will be useful for Ross in Ghana when we're conceiving of the challenges of small scale fishers. Now we've got our 1992 constitution, which devotes an entire section to rights and in particular rights of women and children. It in fact um, integrates the substantive commitments of the ICCPR, as well as CEDA, which is the, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, of course, it also alludes to the need to strengthen procedural obligations, including access to justice, participation in decision making, and the FAO small scale fisheries guidelines. The fisheries management plan in particular talks about all of that. However, what I would like to highlight as some of our conclusions is the big challenges which we face um, in integrating all of this framework into, um, into Ghana. Now, we often would say we're employing a human rights-based approach. However, this is often um, approached in a very, um, um, in a, this is often approached without a distinction for the various nuances. So when I talk about nuances, here I'm talking about class and gender disconnections. Uh, often we have 
throughout this presentation talked about women as a collective, but that is not of itself completely true because even within a discussion of small scale fisheries and women, there are women who are perhaps more well off who own fishing canoes, who own many fishing canoes. So whilst they can't go to the sea, they can actually still, you know, they still have certain power because they own fishing canoes. And some of them actually bankroll the fishermen and loan them money. And yet at the other end of the spectrum are actually women who cannot even, who rely on day-to-day -day subsistence from fishing activities and can only sell a little fish at a time at the market. So in our discussions around a human rights framework, we need to acknowledge that nuance and that difference around class, around gender, etc. There is also the challenge for us of integrating national law policy and international law. Um, I have said that we have, we recognize all of these international frameworks, but within our national law, there is actually a huge disconnect because as it is the legal framework makes it pretty difficult for you to um, enforce those international rights within a national court. And so without going into as much detail, it is quite problematic for those um, vulnerable communities to be able to approach a court and enforce those international obligations, even though Ghana has um, signed up to them. Now, of course, there is also, it's also important to build organizational capacity for women. Um, there is a lot of effort from the moment around ensuring women associations are strengthened and educating them. Um, which is going on and I think that's a good thing and it probably needs to continue. And most importantly, I think what we need to highlight is the question of demand for accountability by duty bearers. Um, in our context, I have mentioned the fact that there was a whole opera earlier on about decision-making about granting new licenses um, and particularly uh, the politics around international investment. So in the context of declining fish stocks, where you're asking small scale fishers to reduce their fishing output and effort and what have you, and then they see that, um, you know, new investments at the upper end of the fishing um, network are being made, then it, it it makes them feel like the, the process is not fair. And so there needs to be greater accountability from all sectors really within the fishing industry. And those are some of the key things we would like to highlight in this discussion. I'm sorry if we've rushed through it, but we're just trying to um, allow time for sufficient questioning at the end. So if there are any questions, we're happy to take and provide some more information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now we will invite um, one UN Nipana Lovni who will join with their unmute mic and, um, and video. Mr. Aruna Mahipala, Senior Researcher at the National Aquatic Resource, Resource Research Center at Development Agency in Sri Lanka. And we welcome all our panelists again for discussion and address the questions that have been raised in the Q&A function. Well, thank you for again uh, for the, the comprehensive presentation. For three presentation, uh, actually we uh, learn much regarding the small scale fisheries and the law related to the small scale fisheries, especially for the human rights. So I have uh, three questions for the three presenter. Uh, so I would like to give my first uh, question of for the professor Elisa. Uh, so uh, actually, the uh, when we consider the the human rights. Uh, it is uh, directly related with the poverty of the people. Uh, so compared to the my country, this uh, mentioned by the Dr. Bola also, uh, especially uh, the poverty level and the education. So it is uh, 
correlation with the human rights. So my question is that uh, although we have a good a legal system and the human rights system in the country, it is uh, quite difficult to uh, properly, uh, properly uh, conduct uh, this regulation because of the low awareness of the people and the law monitoring system. So I wanted to know that uh, how uh, the FAO or the, the, the UN bodies uh, involvement for, uh, to improve the awareness of the uh, locals or the regional levels, uh, because it is very important to success the, uh, the application of the human rights. So that's my first question. And my second question, I will uh, go three questions uh, at once. Uh, my second question is to Dr. Snow. And so, uh, as uh, you mentioned that Sri Lankan law are also uh, very uh, powerful and very good uh, fisheries law that we have. Uh, we have uh, 1996 Act number two for mainly related to fisheries law. And we have amended uh, nine times uh, these fisheries law, especially we adapted international uh, rules and regulation to our laws. Uh, I wanted to know that uh, our in our law also that we uh, fishers have a right to demarcate uh, some kind of areas uh, to protect to be protected and they have uh, they can involve with uh, involve with the the legal process of the government and uh, i wanted to know that especially if there are any subsidies program a specific subsidies program uh, to improve the living conditions because that is also related to the human rights of the people because if they are in uh, under uh, under uh, low income situation it is uh, badly affect for their living standard so that, that is what i wanted to know if there are any uh, specific uh, subsidy program uh, i wanted to know that and my last question is going to dr bola uh, so as you mentioned that uh, you have quite number of uh, uh, high uh, uh, landing site in your country and similar for Sri Lanka, it is, uh, we have around 800 fishing landing sites and uh, 22 uh, fisheries uh, harbor. So we face a uh, uh, little bit big problem to monitor these uh, harbors and the landing site, especially uh, the human uh, resources and the, uh, the fiscal resources. We are lacking for that. So what is uh, in your experience in your country, how the government intention to improve the monitoring system uh, in the fisheries because this is also important for improve the human right and uh, some kind of fundamental rights so that's my three questions and uh, now it's uh, like to give some uh, i have some answer from you thank you elisa maybe you want to start yeah, no, thank you very much. I think this is a really good question. And I think the question like poverty and education also speak to the challenge that Bola underscored at the end of her presentation, how human rights can appear very abstract and somehow disconnected with you know, the realities we're facing. So in terms of then how, how we create that, um, how we empower right holders to, um, to claim their rights and how we also build the understanding uh, as, as Starin was saying, in, uh, in duty bearers to, you know, to understand the responsibilities and, and others to hold them accountable to do so, which is also a point Bola raised. We are thinking about it. FAO is doing a lot of work and I'm sure the colleagues may, may explain that. On our part as One Ocean Hub, we are asking ourselves how, what else we need to do. So one, one part of our work, which is still research is how can we include, sorry, my cat joins in most Zoom calls these days. Um, how we do include this, con this contextual understanding of human rights with the findings from the colleagues doing the, the research on the ground in, um, for instance, engagement with schools, uh, primary schools and otherwise, and bringing together natural sciences, social sciences on the status of fisheries, the, the situation of, of fisher folk, and then bringing into that context what human rights mean. And similarly, our colleagues in South, in South Africa are working on an empathy-theater production, uh, which has really been uh, so important both to give voice to different communities and their perspectives and very diverse perspectives within those communities, 
but also to really create an experience of um, and an understanding of marginalizations that, that they have expressed. And we are now wondering how do we bring human rights into that process? Is it something that can be done as part of the conversation? We, we are still working that out and partly is really I think work across disciplines, how we all engage and contribute to human rights and then how we can offer that and, and further develop that working with um, um, others outside of academia. But, but I think there is potential there, both thinking around uh, engagement with schools and using arts as a way to, to bring together the, the data we have, the knowledge from the context in, in a meaningful dialogue with the more abstract, but really important um, um obligations that we have in human rights so I'll, I'll maybe stop there for now thank you and i can answer um the next question um thank you Runa, for the question um so if you're talking about during covid um period whether there was some form of assistance or, or help um originally there wasn't um any allocated to the small scale fishers it was mainly given um, to the farming communities and to other um, members within um, the society, but not directly um, earmarked or ring things for small scale fishers, which was then um, later, uh, there were some um, grants, very small grants that were given to the small scale fishers to assist them. However, it was, um, it's quite complex because a lot of the rural communities of small scale fishing communities were um, also impacted due to not having water, clean water and access to water. Um, and um, a, a grant wouldn't and getting grants to them would not necessarily have helped them with some of the other um, issues that they had to deal with um, during the pandemic. There are social grants that are available within the country in general for single um, woman led households for children grants for the elderly and so and so on that is accessible by everyone in the community if they meet the particular criteria. Um, but during loss of income and in that it's. Um, and, and during the sit, uh, situation where they weren't able to go and, and get food for themselves, it wasn't sufficient to support, support them during this period. And currently, um, one of the um, Eastern Cape uh, Fisher groups, what they did do during um, a different sort of um, uh, issue that was a stock collapse, a fishery stock collapse, um, and they then applied to the government grant for support to help them through the um, extended closure period uh, during the season, which they then got. But that had to be done with, um, with a collective of people to help and support them to apply for the particular grant. It's not a, an open grant that's available to them. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, but one of the things that I would like to highlight is, I think, is trying to move towards um, access equity, um, sustainability, that there isn't a reliance on the grants, that the small scale fishers have access to their fishing rights, have access to participating in decision making, um, as what is outlined in a lot of the sort of global frameworks that are provided. That answers your question, Irina. And Bola, your name. Um. Yes, so there was a question on um, land and sites. And I will sort of link it to a question in the chat, which I was trying to answer now also on IEU fishing. I think the one thing I didn't really focus on or mention in my presentation is one of the big challenges we have is around actually implementing and enforcing the laws as we have them. So whilst there are gaps in the law, but the bigger problem I think is that even the existing law, we have significant difficulties around it. And those difficulties are attributed uh, sometimes to capacity of um, the bureaucrats. So administrative capacity is a big problem for us. Um, and yes, with that many landing sites, it is quite difficult to police all of them and to monitor them. Now, the law says we should have a representative of uh, the Fisheries Commission, you know, in all of those 
various landing sites to vet it. But you know, in, when you you're you're constrained as to how many people you can actually have on the ground, it's a big problem. And it's a similar thing, also with regards to um, IEU fishing generally. Um, it's a challenge. Monitoring is a challenge now, which in our context we're now looking to see if we can um, think of other innovative ways to actually monitor. And so one of the things we're going to be doing on our um, One Ocean Hub project is to see how we can use technology to assist with some of those key challenges. Um, how perhaps um, basic technology can be useful in that regard. And the other thing we're trying to do is to see how we can actually restructure the way the law is um, conceived. So in our context, often there is a command and control system. So the laws are made at the national and then diffused down to the local level. And of course, that means that for many local communities, they do not have um, enough ownership. They do not feel that the law is perhaps in some instances legitimate, if I can use that advisedly. So what we're trying to do is to see how we can um, shift those perceptions and we want to do that through uh, the use of customary law. So law which is already existing in those local communities, see how we can align them to the legal framework, i.e. the formal framework, and that might help us to get some kind of momentum going. And I know we're running out of time, so I would leave it there at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Some of them, most of them have been answered already, but we have uh, two questions. One is, this is one is for uh, Bola. So it's, uh, we hear a lot about illegal IU fishing by vessels from Asian countries to which the government of Ghana turns a blind eye as one of, of as one important cause of for resource depletion and destruction and finally affecting the lives of the of SSF. What is your take on this matter? Is this not a violation of human rights too? Well, like, can I respond to that question? Sure, yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, you know, there have been several laws that Ghana has enacted to govern the, the fishery sector, especially when it comes to uh, the act. Um, one of the acts, which was enacted in 2002 by uh, the, the, the former government, Kufu's administration. And this particular um, uh, law tried to sort of monitor the, the, the ocean resources in terms of exploitation. But uh, we realized that uh, if you study the law very well, you realize that th these laws have not benefited uh, the small scale uh, fisher folks. Um, it's related to benefit uh, those using the, 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 the industrial fishing uh, uh, equipment. That is why this, there have been a lot of conflict between uh, the fisher folks, the, the indigenous fisher folks, and then the, these uh, industrial uh, trawlers. And uh, the funny aspect is that most of these trawlers, they are foreign, they're owned by foreigners, but you realize that when you go into detail, you say that they've been registered in Ghana by the name of a Ghanaian. And mostly they are the powerful, the politicians. So uh, that is why it seems that government is turning blind side to that, uh, that problem. And you also ask whether it's a, a human rights violation. Of course it is. Because through this process, a lot of uh, 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 job and then livelihood has been deprived. Uh, and then also the right to food. So it's truly a human revolution in terms of the, uh, the state because it's the state that actually uh, ratify and then also um, sign most of these laws that are in line with the international laws that govern the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Well, we have another question also for Dr. Bola, but I think also probably other panelists can also answer this question. Say, um, how to change women participation in countries that are so deeply entrenched with patriar patriarchal system? In our country, the role of women is seen marginal compared to the role of fishermen. What can be done in practical manner? 
Harry, do you want to answer that or should I? Well, <laughs> if you want to just go ahead, I will tell me. Oh, right, okay, okay, so I, I, I give it a go at it. I think, um, um, yes, it, in certain, yes, if you look at it on the surface, yes, it does seem like a um, patriarchal system. Um, uh, I would say that it perhaps started off as um, um, built on convenience. So the, the gender system of fishing was perhaps built on convenience. Um, but I would also further go back to make the assertion that I think that actually is a, that culture is directly related to colonialism. So it is perhaps um, the colonial experience that actually influenced the structure of fisheries as we have it now. And so in my estimation, what I would do well, the most practical thing is of course education, um, but there is also, it's how we conceive of the education. So we, we have to be careful not to speak at this women group. So when I say speak at, uh, when we are outsiders, so we've got to be careful that we're not going in with a preconceived notion of as to, you know, this is how, it has to be done and where, you know, we come from a position of privilege to speak at them. So we've got to, uh, it has to be a kind of um, uh, self-reflexive approach. It's got to be one in which we're engaging, we listen to the voices of the actual women in question and see how they perceive their circumstance and their situation and then walk within that context. Yes, yes, they all sort of know a bit now about some of their rights and of course that education will continue to go ahead. But what we need to do is to be quite careful that we do not come across as um, talking down on them. So it's recognizing the history, but also um, being careful not to be patronizing of some of those communities, I think is perhaps one of the practical things we can do. Yeah, if I may come in, I just a footnote to that. Uh, if, you, if you look at our traditional system, it's, it's very patriarchal in nature. And when you go to the fishing sector, it is, it is sort of governed by two institutions, the, the national and the traditional level. And at the traditional level, that is where you have this traditional project, you have uh, religious leaders, fisher folks, and they, govern the, the ocean based on their beliefs and practices. That is tradition. But as you said, what do we do? Yes, definitely. We know that culture is very dynamic. It's not static. So as Bola said, yes, education and empowerment will, will be a way out. And that is exactly the focus of uh, our project in Ghana. How do we empower the women? Awareness creation. We know that they have a right not to be discriminated against and all this. So, I think with education and then uh, empowerment to empower, uh, empowerment to education, I think uh, definitely this problem too will be sort of uh, reduced if uh, not eliminated at all. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison and Bola. We have a, another UN Nippon fellow that just joined, Ansi Matthew. Uh, Ansi, I don't know if you would like to ask any questions or explain a little bit about India's approach to procedural and substantive rights. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, in India, mainly uh, due to this COVID uh, uh, pandemic situation, uh, most of the uh, small scale fishermen are uh, losing uh, their uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, their livelihood uh, options like because uh, nobody is interested to purchase their uh, um, fish catch or uh, uh, fish products mainly that the woman is suffering because uh, uh, they cannot sell the uh, fishes what uh, they are getting uh, from the fish catch uh, uh, which is uh, caught by the their own husband sometimes uh, you may be knowing that uh, that family um, uh, head like her husband or her father will be going to catch the fish and uh, once it is caught then that uh, in india normally that uh, uh, housewife or uh, that man, uh, lady will be going for uh, selling the fishes 
nowadays uh, nobody is uh, interested to purchase their uh, um, fishes that's why family is suffering a lot what type of actions you can you can take uh, in this regard then one more thing seaweed also the same problem seaweed culture also have, uh, facing the same problem because uh, seaweed uh, nowadays because of this covid situation nobody is interested to take that seaweed whatever uh, they have cultured in the coastal areas could you please suggest what they can do because in this situation uh, uh, small scale uh, fisher women as well as uh, fishers are suffering a lot in india thank you thank you so much thank you ansi thank you very much uh, we have reached the end of our, our webinar we went a little bit over time but it's such an interesting discussion and i hope we can continue on uh, different scenarios by email or or maybe another webinar <laughs> after this one. Um, it has been a very rich discussion and I would like to thank the organizers, the panelists and the audience for participating, for attending this webinar and for very good questions. Um, have a great, great, great rest of the day and or a good evening. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.